This was the birth of a new art movement in the Western world. And Jack Stewart was there to document it all. These materials came from the collection of an artist named Jack Stewart, a very accomplished artist. He was born and raised in Atlanta. Interestingly enough, in the 1930s, he started taking art lessons at the High Museum when he was 10 years old. And we have some of his art assignments in the collection, and you could tell when he was 10 years old, he was talented. He became the vice president and provost of the Rhode Island School of Design. And as he did that, they suggested, as he says, that he get a PhD. And so for his PhD, he studied New York City subway graffiti, because this was the early 1970s, and this was an art form that was just coming into existence. He wanted to document these materials in a way where he could examine the different aesthetic and artistic choices that were made during the creation of this art. Because his argument in his dissertation is that mass transit art, that subway art, is different from all the other types of graffiti that preceded it over the thousands of years. He, especially in 1972 and 73, went out weekly to take these photographs. After that, he didn't go out as often, but he continued to document the birth of this art form um, until 1979. Graffiti writers know who Jack Stewart was. Graffiti writers today know who Jack Stewart was because of the remarkable photographs and documents he has of this movement. And many of the graffiti writers have the University of Michigan dissertation reprints of Jack Stewart's dissertation because they consider it the Bible. Knowing and understanding the history of this underground culture is very important to them, and it's also important to them to pass it on. And it's a fascinating process to look at in this subculture, how history gets understood and passed on. What's really interesting about this art movement, if you will, is the fact that this is actually the first art movement that was started by kids. Almost all the early graffiti writers were under the age of 20, some of them as young as eight or 10. And it just became a way for them during the course of their life through the city to put their name in places. It started out with just names, usually with markers, on the inside of the subway cars in New York City in the late 1960s and early 1970s. Eventually, the interiors of the car became so filled with graffiti that the writers started looking for somewhere else to go. And so they started painting on the outside of the cars. And these are some of the early ones that are usually in white on these early red cars, and so it's just a name. And from these small names, then they ended up doing larger pieces with their tags. And the beautiful thing about the subway system is in New York City is if you paint this on a car, there's a chance that it might travel all the way through the five boroughs. And so the goal of these riders was to be quote unquote all city, which meant that your tags were all over the five boroughs. And the easiest way to do that was by painting the subway cars because each day they journeyed through this metropolitan behemoth, taking the names of these unknown children with them on those journeys. It spread like wildfire. The kids wrote on everything they possibly could in the city and the city struck back. It became a crime. It was considered vandalism. People were chased and died in the, in the subway system uh, because they hit the third rails. But what the MTA ended up doing was coming up with a chemical paint and a buff to remove the paint from all of them, from the exterior. So there is, there is a point when there is no more graffiti on subway cars.
It was this war, the city and the establishment, the government, the police, and these kids from the Bronx, from Brooklyn, trying to express themselves, and then this truly collision of cultures until the graffiti was wiped out in the subway system. And they had to move on to other places that you see now, walls, freeways, overpasses. Folks around the country and around the world saw all these images and they wanted to do it. But guess what? Most metropolitan areas don't have public transportation systems like New York City. So they had to find places where they could write. And then eventually somebody figured out freight trains. The benefit of freight trains is they go all over the country. And after NAFTA, they go into Mexico and Canada. So instead of being all city, you can literally go all over the country and into other countries. So there ended up being an entire culture built up around freight trains that still exists today and is still a very powerful expression of this phenomenon that began in Philadelphia in the late 60s and then moved to New York City and flowered in the, in the 70s. I was speaking to a Chicago graffiti writer. I asked him, why do you do it? And he said, because this allows me to scream, I am still here. One of the things I love about this collection is it helps change people's minds about what the Rose Library and what libraries in general collect. These materials are important cultural, aesthetic, and historical documents. They cover a movement that, as you know, if you look at your phone or on social media, you can see graffiti like this all over the world now. And so the library has these materials because they're significant and we can use them for research, we can use them for teaching, and we can use them for the connections that they place with other collections that we have. The birth of hip hop, rap, and graffiti in New York City, but then how it was spread. It was such a powerful movement that people in Atlanta, Houston, Chicago, Los Angeles, and elsewhere around the world wanted to get involved. And so our collections are a way of examining this process of expansion and bringing all these people into what ends up being a very powerful street movement that becomes so much more.